Hi, everybody. It's Sue Jones, uh, your president of your TSO. And uh, welcome to our webinar today, Filters on, uh, we're going to have a webinar about filters today from Paula Smith. And just as we get into that, um, I just want to say a couple things. So welcome again from the RTSO. I just put up a, a slide with all of our pictures so you know who we all are. Um, so we have the voting members of the board and then the non-voting members of the, of the board as well. So um, the voting members include myself, Kelly as the president-elect, Shauna McDonald as our airwaves editor, Sue Martin as our treasurer, uh, Wendy Foote as our student advisory uh, chair, co-chair, I guess I should say, and she's also a director, and then Sylvia Mortimer as the community co-chair, and she's a director, and Farzad uh, Rafi uh, as a director, and he's our social media guy, and then Gino DePinto as one of our directors as well. And then on the non-voting side, we have Nancy Garvey, who I'm sure you all know, uh, Mika, Steve, who's the co-chair of the leadership committee with Kelly, Greg, who's a co-chair with, with um, Wendy of the student one, and then Tina and Shirley both uh, do the research committee. Next slide, please, Paula. Uh, so we just wanted to say a big thanks to everybody, A, for joining, and B, for supporting everything that uh, we're doing, and, and hopefully what we are doing is making a difference for you and your practice. So we know it's a total time of uncertainty. We are trying to remain flexible and as the situation changes, we try to evolve and, and, and create these webinars for topics that are relevant to all of you. We know how difficult it is right now and we totally appreciate your support and your willingness to come together at such short time frames. Uh, so we thank you. We're trying, really trying hard to start to, and of course I'm touching my face, thank God I'm not in the hospital right now. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but trying to look at, you know, a week, two weeks, three weeks down the road and uh, anticipate what some of the topics might be and try to get webinars organized now. And so Kelly and I are going to work on this over the weekend and we're going to try and set up some stuff early in the week so that your notices aren't so late. So I do apologize for that because I know how hard it is sometimes to do these things. All right, next uh, slide. So our agenda quickly, I don't want to take up too much time, is uh, I'll just quickly update you on some of the activities we've been doing in the RTSO. Paula's gonna talk about filters and then we'll have some time for questions. So just, this is a very quick update. Um, so we have been communicating with Critical Care Services Ontario on the ventilator plan in terms of accessing uh, that ventilator pool that they've bought in the past and then any additional ones more importantly that are coming on. Uh, we do hear that it's going to take maybe a month so I'm not quite sure how um, how if you're going to be able to access new vents right away but there are some uh, within the pool now. Uh, we've also made a request to become a part of the critical care command table that's hosted by Ontario Health and right now we have not been at that table I don't think they've met more than once or twice, uh, but we do want to be part of that because we certainly are aware that uh, physicians and nurses are part of that. And as part of the ICU team, we've requested to become part of that, that group. So we'll let you know if that happens. Um, we've constantly been bringing up current issues on the daily COVID morning calls with the Ministry of Health and the Emergency Operations Center including concerns around PPE that you've uh, all, all sent us, staffing concerns, ventilator and consumable concerns. So if there's anything that you're worried about, um, either as an organization or um, you know, in, in a different sector, like say the community or in the acute care or any other sector that you work in, and you haven't had any kind of resolution, please send a, an email to us at office at rtso.ca. We can bring it up. Uh, we've been doing some media posts and uh, having some interviews with different um, reporters. And yesterday, uh, I'm sure some of you probably have seen it, there was a CBC interview with Kelly and Steve Buziak in Oakville at the hospital there. And today, actually, myself and Sylvia are going to be talking to HuffPost Canada and doing a uh, interview there. And I know I've seen other interviews, so we're starting to get the name out about what respiratory therapists do, so that's fantastic. 
Uh, we've been posting resources on the RTSL website and Gino and our webmaster have been doing a fantastic job. So there's a, a huge list, so feel free to browse through it. And if you have any questions, just uh, send us an email. We've been participating on the provincial collaboration table and the communications table. I've been attending those uh, calls and again, bringing up kind of relevant issues. Uh, there, we've been having weekly calls with the CRTO, which have been fantastic and, and uh, they've been uh, so supportive and, and we're helping each other as we get along through this uh, these crazy times. We've had some emails back and forth and some uh, conversations with the CSRT and they put out a statement on uh, ventilating multiple patients with one machine. So you might want to look at that. And then setting up webinars, obviously, on, the, on relevant topics, and then obviously engaging with some of our vendors, including Paula and Medtronics and others, in terms of what are good resources uh, for COVID-19 specific to respiratory therapy and posting those on the website too. All right, so that's enough of that. Next slide. Um, Paula didn't, uh, I, I, she doesn't have it on her deck, but I have it. So I'm just gonna go to it. And, I'm just going to introduce Paula. So that, that slide is going to be for later. Um, but Paula is a okay. respiratory therapist of 20 years for a very, with a varied background in home care, research, critical care, and industry. Paula is currently the clinical specialist in the respiratory monitoring division of Medtronic. She also works as a staff RT in Aurelia Soldiers Memorial. She used to work with me and Barry too. Uh, and is a CPR first aid and NRP instructor. Paula is a member of the RTSO and is, a, and is part of our RTSO leadership committee and is extremely friendly. <laughs> All right, I'll turn it over to you, Paula. Awesome, thanks so much. I'm just gonna wave hi so everyone can see me. Uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Sue, and thank you, Kelly and Sue, and the RTSO um, leadership uh, committee for having me on today. I'm gonna turn my webcam off in a moment because uh, it's stealing all the bandwidth and I live in the sticks, so I don't want it to stop. But I first wanted to start by thanking you without getting too emotional. Um, all of you RTs who are at the front lines, who are in any line treating these COVID-19 patients and helping your hospitals prepare for safe care of those patients and other patients. I think uh, right now you guys are doing a tremendous job at raising awareness of how valuable we RTs are. And I just wanted to thank you from the bottom of my heart uh, even though I'm not at the bedside right at this moment in time and I serve in a different capacity, I think we as RTs all across the province, no matter what we do, need to band together and support the RTSO because they're our voice in Ontario. And I think I've said this before, I don't know about you, but I am tired of being first to be called and last to be told. And the RTSO is changing that. They're showing up as Sue just, just described. They're at the table right now advocating for us getting us involved where we provide such benefits. So I just like to urge you, if you're not already a member, please sign up. We need your help. We need to show that we actually do represent the voices of our teas in Ontario. And I think there's no better time than now, now to do that. So I just wanted to say that and I'm gonna turn off my webcam now. The slide deck will be available after um, the presentation as well for, for your use. So again, um, I fully disclose that I work for a company that sells filters, but I want to assure you I'm not here today to sell you filters. I'm here today as part of an can amazing Canadian team uh, to arm you with the knowledge that you need to keep you and your patients safe. I've been spending a lot of time speaking to clinicians about filtration, as have my colleagues across Ontario. You may know Brooke Thompson, who's a, a fantastic RT and amazing uh, support for us. Uh, she uh, covers the, uh, great, the Toronto area. And then we have Hans Montoya who uh, covers um, basically everything that I don't and Brooke doesn't. Um, and again, we're not at the bedside and you guys are, but please think of us vendors as people who are here to support you. Um, we have a mission, um, all of us, right, have a mission right now. The RTSO is obviously to promote and advance interests of Ontario therapists. We talked about that. And, Really, as, as, as people who work in industry, we have missions too, and, and our mission at Medtronic is to alleviate pain, restore health, and extend life, and we're here to be supportive of you. So I just, want, I just wanted to share that with you because we really do care. I've had numerous conversations with other vendors who supply filters. They're pleased about this webinar. We're all willing to work together to help you, so please don't be afraid to reach out to us. So let's get going. 
So what is the purpose of today's presentation? Well, listen, why are we using filters? There's a lot of misinformation about ratings, filtration efficiency testing, and limitations of filtration. And I have to give a shout out to Richard Couts, our, our ventilation specialist, because he is the one who shared a lot of this knowledge and put a lot of this together. I also want to share the Canadian marketing team and the global marketing team who have been very supportive of me sharing this knowledge with you. So obviously, why do you use filters? Well, we don't want to prevent, we want to prevent cross-contamination. We all know where to use them. We're all RTs, so I don't really need to review that. But remember, filters are bi-directional. They protect patient equipment and staff. So obviously, why do we filter? Well, we get in contact with respiratory secretions, right? It's the mucus that binds us, as they say. And large uh, droplets appear to be account for most transmissions of influenza. Of course, we're dealing with a virus right now. We know that it can, uh, certain viruses can be airborne and they can be airborne for a prolonged period of time. So the important thing about filtration, number one, is to actually contain filtration, uh, or sorry, containment of the virus. So we know right now there's global travel restrictions, there's quarantines, there's self-isolation, we have PPE. But the number one most important factor in disease control uh, when treatments are limited is to protect workers by preventing hazards entering into the breathing zone in the first place. So that's from the National Institute of Occupational Health and Safety. So how do we do that? What is a filter? What does it look like? So if we think about filtration, there's a couple of different ty uh, obviously types of filters that we'll review. But if you think about the deposition mechanisms of filtration, and, and some of, for some of you, this may be a review, and I apologize, and maybe you've just graduated and you're still well-versed in this stuff, but if you think about um, the, sorry, pardon me, the deposition. So there's a, a number of different ways that viruses and bacteria can deposit, and filters, if you can imagine, can do a lot of things, right? So if you think about our filters that we're using, we need filters that have minimal resistance, but have to stop all the particles that may have extremely small fractions of a micron size. So if you imagine how a filter is designed, like a bunch of long skinny fibers packed together into a mat, obviously it has to hair, hair air, not hair, so like a French person, no offense French people, uh, air has to get through this mat of filter fibers, and to do so, the individual gas mo molecules have to duck and weave their way through the filter material. So if you think about all the different ways that we can filter, there's a bunch of different ways we can filter. So you've got Brownian motion, which tends to filter out uh, less than 0.1 uh, microns. You have impaction, which is basically like bumper cars hitting them. We have gra gravitational setting, we have electrostatic attraction, and we actually have in interception. So gravitational settling is a very slow process and virtually irrelevant in the tiny period of time that it takes for a particle to pass through filter material. Brownian motion and electrostatic attraction are extremely important to trap very small particles, typically less than 0.1 microns. And inertial impaction is extremely important to trap larger particles, typically larger than 0.8 microns. So in summary, when we put it all together, electrostatic attraction, Brownian motion are extremely effective at trapping very small particles. You can see that the collection of efficiency is roughly about 100%. Inertial impact has the same extremely high effectiveness at relative, relatively large particle sizes. So what we end up is with a filter that works great with tiny stuff, it works great with big stuff, but there's a mid-sized particle that's too large for Brownian motion and electrostatic attraction, yet too small for inertial impaction. And we call this the most penetrating particle size, so MPP is how they usually describe it, or MPS, I believe. And it's the hardest particle size for the filter to capture. So I'm getting a lot of questions from people and saying, has this filter been tested for COVID-19? And that's really not the best question to be asking. We need to be asking about the most penetrating particle size because it's the point at which any filter is not is at its worst, of, worst efficiency. And it really describes the worst case particle size when it comes to filtration. So we ask how small a particle will this filter capture? But that doesn't really make a lot of sense if we understand that Filtration fil filters are really good at small particles, really small, and they're really good at big ones. It's the mid-range ones that they have a hard time getting. So here's an example. You look at your filters because you're worried about your safety. And this filter says it stops 99.9999 of SARS coronaviruses. Sounds like a really awesome filter. But an individual SARS coronavirus is about 0 0.03 microns. So that's the SARS one. Um, our current coronavirus COVID-19 is 0.8, sorry, 0.3. 
0.07 to 0.09 from the literature that I can see. And we'll talk about that in a little bit more. But it's extremely easy to filter out due to Brownian motion and electrostatic attraction. Uh, but does it really mean that you're protected? Um, the simple answer is that you don't know yet because in the real world, viruses may be contained in a particle at exactly the most penetrating particle size. So the same filter that claims to be 99.999% effectiveness at 0.3 microns could perform only at 50% at the most effective, uh, sorry, at the, at the most penetrating particle size. So basically, if we don't know how well the filter performs at the worst case scenario, the other data is not really that relevant. And if we don't know how well the filter performs at MPPS, then we have no idea if we're truly protected. So again, it's the most a difficult particle size uh, to filter because it's too small to be filtered by inertial impaction, interception or gravitational setting, but it's too big to be effectively filtered by Brownian motion. So the MPPS is typically considered to be 0.1 to 0.5 microns. And it's also important that filters can differentiate between particles that are potentially dangerous microorganisms or simple water, dust, or salt particles. This is a key concept when we decide which tests we should use to evaluate these particles. And we don't really have to perform any tests using dangerous microorganisms because a filter doesn't know them apart, right? It doesn't know if it's your dusty environment or if it's a, if it's a, uh, a virus or a bacteria. So here's kind of what we're talking about. The gray circle is a filter fiber. Imagine it's sticking out of the screen towards you. So this is just a cross section of the fiber. Note that this bacteria has enough inertia to be captured on a, a filter fiber. And you can see the bacteria continues in a straight line, even through the air slip airstream is going around the filter. Now the next slide shows two viruses which follow the slipstream around the filter fiber, but due to chaotic Brownian motion, they are easily captured when they contact the fiber. Here's a shot of the most penetrating particle easing, easily making its way around the filter fiber. And then in this particle, especially when it's loaded full of viruses, it's our worst case scenario. So if we know how well a filter works against this 0.3 micron particle, then we know how well it's going to work against anything that we throw at it. So I'd ask you to, to stop asking, how does this filter work against coronavirus? Because that's really the wrong question. The right question is to ask, how well does this filter work at the most penetrating particle size? And how does that compare to the filter I'm currently using? And then you're able to actually compare filter to filter. Now let's talk a little bit about filter efficiency testing. So if you look at the, a bacterial filter, filtration efficiency or viral efficiency, and the data might show 99.999 efficiency. It doesn't, again, mean that you're adequately being protected. But manufacturers run tests because you keep asking for the data, and so far, so, so far, everything so far um, with what we've learned, we know that we want to actually test for the MPPS particle size. So, Viruses are typically smaller, but larger viruses can approach MPPS. And we want to make sure that when we look at those data sheets and they show 99.999, and there's a bunch of nines, which sounds really good, we want to make sure that they actually have been tested in different ways. So what happens when you put these microorganisms in a solution? When they aerosolize them, so the particles are around 0.3 microns in size, which is 10 times the diameter of the MPSS, and there's a whole bunch of science behind that, but we don't really care. So you have this enormous particle, enormous particle size because it's a mass uh, humidity. Um, and at this size, we want to check and see whether or not that filtration is good. So we say, how well does this filter perform against some bacteria? Well, the data that's used to test in dry gas conditions is not really the most accurate and doesn't really reflect our real world. So now what we can do then instead is we'll actually test with NaCl. So just because your filter says 99.999 doesn't mean you're fully protected. What you actually want to do is look at different types of testing. And that's the NaCl, or sodium chloride testing method. Currently, it's the uniquely accepted test method for assessing filtration. And filters are challenged with nebulized sodium chloride particles of the most penetrating particle size, so 0.1 to 0.3 microns. So again, that's gonna give you a true picture of how your filter is gonna perform in, in worst case scenario. And you can see there are a number of filters that have NaCl 
filtration efficiency uh, posted. So the expression of the test results tend to be in penetration value, and the percentage filtration efficiency is usually 100 minus the penetration value. So that's how kind of how they're representing. There's not really international standards. Standards can be done in vitro or in vivo, and there's some inconsistencies in testing, but not typically with the NACL method. So the main parameters are the ba ba bacterial viral cha challenge, uh, the teeter reduction, and the bacterial viral filtration efficiency. So that's what we're going to look at. So I'm sure you've all seen these numbers, all these 99.999. So what does an extra nine mean? So you'll see from this chart, if they list a filtration efficiency of 99%, it means that there's going to be a passage of one microorganism every 100. And as you move up with an addition of nine, you can see how the math works. So if a filter has a BFE, of 99.999999, sorry, it'll allow a passage of one microorganism every one million. So you can see how the efficiency goes up and how a nine makes a difference. But you'll also notice that the filtration efficiency can be listed both with dry gas testing conditions and the NACL test. And you should notice here on, on the comparison of this filter here, this example, that the bacterial and viral rating is rated at 99.9999, but that bacterial uh, or viral rating changes when they do the NACL test. So that's really the one you want to be looking at so that you can compare. So the main factors of a filtration efficiency is obviously when they're doing testing is the number of microorganisms, the flow rate, how long they suspended the nebulization, uh, pathogenesis, and such. So a lot of us have lived in the world of N95, N100. That's kind of what we, that's, that's, those are kind of terms that we're used to. Or, or I'm hearing two people refer to HEPA filtration. So if you apply NIOSH testing, which is the, the, the testing that they do with, with sodium chloride, where they measure how many particles get through the mask, an N95 mask has a greater than 95% efficiency at MPPS. So that kind of gives you an idea of how to compare filtration in relation to what you know as, as far as mask filtration. And again, an N99 would be greater than 99, and an N100 mask means that you've got greater than 99.97% efficiency at, at the most penetrating particle size. And that's an, an international standards organization um, standard, <laughs> sorry. Of course, we know that there are limit limitations to filtration, um, and we can talk a little bit more about that condensation and, and, and such. So hopefully so far, so good. It's just an overview. So just ensure that when you're comparing filters, that you're actually using the data that is relevant to us right now. And I would encourage you to, to look at the sodium chloride challenge testing. I know that we have that information available uh, I, InterSurgical has also recently made that uh, information available, available, and if you don't have it at your, your disposal, then just contact your local rep and, and just let them know uh, whether or not, uh, or sorry, let them know what your questions are. A lot of the questions I've also been having uh, is about what is the difference between mechanical filtration and electrostatic filtration membranes. And so electrostatic fil uh, filtration membranes are, are Basically, sorry, give me one second here. They're basically thin, flat electrostatic fibers that are created during manufacturing, uh, and they introduce a permanent electrical polarity uh, into the felt material. This is kind of a, a, an, an idea of what it looks like. They're really low resistance, um, and they do a really effective job. Mechanical filters are usually pleated, and they allow a larger surface area of filtration in a mini minimum volume, and the small, small pore size doesn't tend to allow passage of liquid water. The mechanical filter membrane is a hydrophobic medium consisting of ceramic-covered microfibers, and thanks to its microporosity of the fiber web, the germs are trapped by means of a sort of screen filtration. So the relatively high density of the medium requires a large filtering service to permit adequate flow resistance values during ventilation. And so to optimize the filtering surface, filtering surface into a reduced filtration volume, the mechanical membrane is generally folded. So HEPA, you've heard, is 
an acronym for high efficiency particulate air or high efficiency particulate arrestants. And this acronym refers to a filter that is manufactured, tested, certified, and labeled in accordance with current HEPA filter standards. But typically you could associate the term HEPA with what's called a mechanical filter. So mechanical filters are, are pleated hydrophobic membranes. They're super efficient. They have a small pore size. And again, they're, they're highly hydrophobic or water repel repellent. And this is kind of the principles of a mechanical filtration. You've got direct interception, inertial impact, and diffusional inter interception at play. Now, remember I said we would talk about the size of organisms? Well, the size of different microorganisms here are listed. And what I've come to know from varying literature, and it's gonna depend on where you go, and I listed where I got the size from, but it's, it's thought to be that COVID-19 is actually 0.07 to 0.016 in size. And you can see that how that compares to some of the other um, bacterium and viruses that, that we're filtering out. So there I get a lot of questions again is, what should I use for a COVID-19 patient? Well, what we should use for a COVID-19 patient is probably what we should use for any patient considering what we've learned about the MTSS. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about where to use and how, how to use, but I'll just go over the features and benefits of filters. So mechanical filters prevent the risk of cross-contamination. They are highly hydrophobic, equal water repellent. Um, there are a bunch of different versions that you can get. And then electrostatic filters have great bacterial and viral efficiency, and they prevent the risk of cross-contamination as well. They tend to have lower flow resistance, and they're the most appropriate choice for pediatric and neonatal patients. Heat moisture exchangers are super important when we think about protecting airway mucociliary actin. Bring me back to my uh, high flow days and our awesome video I love watching of all the little cilia beating up mucus. But we need to remember that while we're trying to balance our safety with filtration, that we need to be mindful that we're providing appropriate humidity to the, air, uh, to the airways. And I certainly won't get into that uh, today, but this is just simply how a filtering membrane in combination with a heat moisture exchanger would work with a cellulose element and without a hygroscopic cellulose element. So that's just how, how it would work. So one side, fil one side filters and the other side provides that heat moisture exchange. So what do I use and where? So that is the time-tested question that I'm going to try to answer. Of course, there will be some caveats to that. But we know that we have to put filters on machine side to protect our, our clinicians. We know that we have to put filters at the patient side to protect uh, patients and, and we clinicians and the air that we're breathing. And it's really important for us to know that we're using the right filter to keep us safe. But we also at the same time need to make sure that we're conserving resources and being responsible about using what we have we know that there's been a global demand for filters around the world. I can confirm that from all the other manufacturers that I've spoken to in many areas like in the, in the world. And I just, I just want to urge you to be mindful that you keep yourself safe, and that's number one. But also, please make sure that you're using resources effectively, because there could come a day where if this virus explodes, we are, we are faced with, with a shortage. And I'm not saying that's going to happen. It is, it is not a Medtronic statement or an intersurgical statement, but I just want us to be prepared and make sure that we're being um, very, very uh, diligent about when we use things and why we use them. And so on the machine side, we tend to use electrostatic filters and mechanical filters. And again, the same thing on the other side. Now, electrostatic filters offer a high level of antimicrobial removal and low resistance, but they do have some limitations. They're best used in low humidity situations where um, you don't have to necessarily worry about condensate. The problem with condensate and that thin membrane is that should there be a change, a big variation in peak pressure, there is potential that liquid can move through that, that, that filter no matter what the filtration rating is. That's how electrostatic filters behave in high humidity situations. So where to use? So of course, please consult your manufacturer's device use instructions prior to use of any filters on your devices. But this serves as a general rule of thumb of where you can use filters. 
electrostatic filters, pardon me. So at the Y of an anesthesia circuit is a great place to put that. Typically non-invasive ventilation, so BiPAP, bi-level, whatever you want to call it, these devices work best with low resistance filters and typically aren't in situations with high humidity. You also may use um, an electrostatic filter at the inlet of a high flow heated humidifier blender. So in the OptiFlow version where it's the blender head and then you have the pot separate, you could use that as the inhalation filter. You can also use it uh, as an in, for inhalation of anesthetic gases for laboring mums. So recently I had a call from a hospital who wanted to change from electrostatic filters to mechanical filters for the inhalation of Entinox for their laboring mums. So if you think about that, it, it, it doesn't really make sense. It's not a highly humid environment. It's a situation where we're intermittently utilizing the filter, so you shouldn't see accumulation of that, um, of that condensate. And it really would not be the most appropriate utilization of resources by using a mechanical filter in place of an electrostatic. Uh, we also tend to use electrostatic filters for pediatrics and neonatal care. Um, filters I don't see used commonly. We're seeing an increase in uptake on that. Please be mindful of the fact that mechanical filters are not available for neonatal patients because of that large surface area and the resistance to flow. And there are some available that go down in the lower pediatric range. But again, um, you just want to risk stratify and you, I, I, would just, I would just urge you to be responsible with your use of filtration and make sure that it's actually really required again. I care about your safety, but we also need to be mindful of the resources at hand. Currently, the neonatal filters in Canada uh, have much limited supply across all manufacturers. The filter, obviously, on the respiratory limb of a ventilator, that can vary based on manufacturer's recommendations. So again, I would refer to your, to your device use instructions. Um, each individual fill, uh, a ventilator typically will have some sort of direction as to the filter that you can use, but may also add other things like um, the resistance to flow must be less than X, Y, and Z at 100 liters per minute. So make sure that if you're going to sub out a filter or use something different, that you look to make sure that it's meeting the specs uh, via dead, dead space or resistance to flow at higher inspiratory flow levels. Because if you don't do that and you put a filter that has a lot of resistance, your ventilator may not pass its, its self-check. And that goes for mechanical or electrostatic. So mechanical filters are, again, remember they're, they're based on a, a bunch of membranes and they have a weave of microfibers and they create very small micropores. They've got a high filtration efficiency. They have a low resistance to airflow and a large surface area. So these are actually an ideal filter medium for both low humidity and high humidity environments. We typically see them between the patient uh, and ventilator on the machine side to protect contamination of the unit. We use them on our bag valve mask, and we sometimes use them on the, uh, mostly use them on the inspiratory side of the mechanical ventilator. So it's important, again, to consult manufacturer's device use instructions for the reasons that I stated beforehand so you want to make sure that whatever filter you're putting on is safely protecting you via any CL testing, but you also want to make sure that it has the right um, specs that will match and allow you to perform up appropriately with your ventilator. Now, there are also some new recommendations uh, for COVID-19 from the American Society of Anesthesia. And they actually have this really nifty chart that speaks to the breathing circuit filters that are recommended by application. So what they're looking at is what would happen in the case that we might have a, we have to use our anesthetic gas machine as a ventilator. So filtration recommendations are actually on that website and this chart's actually a really cool tool. They also have a document uh, called um, FAQ on anesthesia machine use, protection and decontamination during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, that is available in the Anesthesia Patient Safety Association, and I've posted the link at the end of this webinar as well. Uh, that will give you uh, important information. So knowing what we know now and what we've learned together, it's completely appropriate to continue to use your electrostatic filters in the OR cases, unless you're running really low flows that are going to cause condensate, or unless it's perhaps you're running long cases, or you're, you're potentially worried for, for other reasons. 
But again, most of the filters that you're using do have uh, sodium chloride testing available for your review. And I would, I would just urge you to, to look and, and check it out so that not only you feel comfortable, but you're using the right filter for, for the right approach. So here's a list of resources. So uh, the CR2 has been amazing. Uh, we've got Public Health, Canadian Anesthesia Society, our amazing RCSO, of course, the World Health Organization, uh, CPS as well um, has come out with a statement in regards to uh, neonatal resuscitation and transport of, of, of babies. I just wanted to mention too, it's a complete offside and not filtration related, but BCLS and NRP governing bodies have provided an extension for certification for us. I know I'm getting a lot of calls, so I just thought I'd share that information because the NRP just came out recently. So these extensions are available until July 31st, but they may change depending on the COVID-19 situation. So for those of you who are worried about the CPR or NRP police, <laughs> you're okay for a while. <laughs> um, I just thought maybe I'd offer this opportunity to open it up to questions. Anything I can't answer at this moment in time, we will answer the questions and post on the RTSO website. All right, thanks, Paula. That's uh, pretty informative there, that's pretty good. So uh, there's a couple questions, I'm gonna start with them. And as you start thinking about uh, questions in the audience, just uh, start pu putting them in the chat question box and uh, we'll ask them as we go along. So. I think you've kind of answered this one, but I'm going to let you reiterate it. So does every okay. COVID patient on event need an exhalation filter? And it, can, it, can it be on every single ventilator or not? I, I, I've not had the experience uh, clinically of having a ventilator that does not have an exhalation filter. So, I'm not sure if I clearly understand the question. I okay. think no matter what, exhalation filters filter out the exhale gases coming from your patient. So you need to filter out the exhale gases from your patient. And depending on your circuit setup, you're going to have to determine which configuration of filtration is best. Like if you're using single, I don't know if they mean single limb, I'm not 100% sure, or dual yeah. limb. If you oh. place filter, so if you're using single limb, for instance, for some, you can place a filter at the outlet of the ventilator, like at machine side, and then place a filter or a filter HME at the patient side. And then that way, whatever the patient exhales will be filtered through that filter, and then you're protecting the machine. I hope that answers the question. If it doesn't, I'm sorry. If it doesn't, Peter, just uh, type, a, type a clarification, but I think that answers it, yeah. Uh, so the next question is, uh, some spermers do not have a filter. Um, I think we should advocate moving forward for using only equipment that allows uh, the attachment of a filter, So, or the RT should use an N95 mask uh, while they're doing spermetry. We're not testing right now, but, in, but we can learn about improving best practices moving forward. What are your, your thoughts there? I, I completely agree, and I've used some of those spirometers in, in my career and often wondered how, how that might impact me. You know, you're in eMERGE doing, doing spirometry for your COPD pathway, and uh, I definitely would uh, advocate for the use of filtration with spirometry for our protection. And if you think about the way that viruses and bacteria work, if we wear a 95 mask, we may be protected. But if I'm in a merge and I've got those magic curtains, I'm probably not protecting the people beside me. So I think that filtration definitely for spirometry should be, should, in my opinion, as an RT, not as a Medtronic employee, it, it should actually be for filtration for everyone or bust. Yeah, I agree too. Um, is a mechanical filter always an HME? No. So you can have a mechanical filter with or without heat moisture exchange. And I, Sorry about that, I think I glossed over that a bit. So both electrostatic and mechanical filters can be uh, are available alone or they are available with a heat moisture exchanger. So you would only use straight up filtration on m machine side, but on the patient side is where you may choose to use a heat moisture exchanger. Okay. Um, I, I'm going back to the first question uh, again, because they, okay. they were referencing specifically an LTV ventilator. So it is a single limb. 
So should yes. there always be um, a filter on the exhalation side of the LTV? The DSU or the setup that I that I saw in their device use does not does not state that it is required. So I, I can make that document available because I, I was helping out the Winnebago Hospital in Moose Factory who use an LTV. Um, and in that setup, it just has a, a, I think it just has a picture of the expert. You know what? I don't know. I'm going to have to look and I'll post it for you. I'll post the sheet for you. I found it online of how to set it up. But as I recall, there was an N100 on the machine side. But there's... And then there was an, uh, a filter recommended at the patient side. Yeah, okay. I'm confusing myself. Well, I think I think typically what I've seen on LTVs is there's a filter on the outlet, like where the gas comes out of the machine. Yeah. And that's just your basic, it doesn't have to, it's not an HME. That's just a filter filter. And then at the patient Y end, there's an HME. Yeah. I, I believe that's the best practice. So if you put a filter at the machine side and a filter HME at the patient side, then you know you're protected from front to back. Right. And then you're, you're providing heat moisture exchange for your patient because LTVs obviously aren't equipped with, with uh, heat and humidity. Right. Exactly. Um, okay. The next question. Do you recommend mechanical filters for BVM use in a code blue situation? So how about non and how about non rebreather masks? Any recommendations there? Okay. So in a code situation, um, so I think a code situation, irrelevant of whether or not it's a code situation, if you're in an, an environment where you're going to be using a filter on the end of an endotracheal tube or, or a T-piece or a Y or your extension set, and there's a potential for humidity, then definitely I would use a mechanical filter. Um, and the reason saying why is that if I hork a big loogie into that into, into that extension, or say I'm suffering from pulmonary edema and I've you know got the fancy pig milkshake bubbling up, that's, that's, that would be a high humidity or high moisture situation. And then if the patient coughed in that case, there is potential that that could go through across to the membrane. And again, I'm speaking as a, as a respiratory therapist clinician. My experience during codes is that patients vomit, so there's liquid, uh, they have pulmonary edema, or potentially there's blood. Um, and so those liquids, then, what we know is that a mechanical filter is extremely, extremely hydrophobic, whereas an electrostatic filter is less, is still hydrophobic, but it's less, it, it doesn't work nearly as, as well uh, in those kind of high humidity moisture situations. Okay, so you're saying a mechanical filter is better at, um, in that situation? I would, I would say it's, it's more ideal. Again, I would defer to your... NECL filtration, like your, your sodium chloride filtration, and, and look at the specs of your filter. Okay. And again, th this may be a change in practice for some of us to have electrostatic filters. I mean, if you think about it though, too, you could, if you're not putting the filter directly onto the endotracheal tube, so the, it depends on where you work, right? Or who last stocked the Ambu bag. But if you don't, if you're using, say, um, uh, an extension, you know what I'm, I can't think, you know what I'm talking yeah. about, right? Little Y yeah. sentence. Then you're distancing yourself from the source of the possible liquid. So I think in that case, there's less chance of that liquid getting up to the filter and then coming through. But if you're using it directly on, directly on, you're jamming it on, then you, you, you're, you're in closer proximity. So I think you just have to, we have to use our intelligent, amazing, noble brains, SRTs, because we have that knowledge, and, and make that choice based on your situation and your patient demographics using the information from the device uses. Okay, great. Is that fair? Yep, yep. Okay. Uh, does filtration efficacy de decrease over time? Some of these filters have a maximum 24 hour use, but should we be changing them more often if they are being used as a patient? Why? Gotcha, okay. So that's, that's actually a really good question. So all of the filters have been tested like all of our filters and all manufacturers have been tested and we have recommendations typically of changing them every 24 hours. Um, does that mean that they lose efficiency as the day goes on? No. Um, they've been tested. So whatever the recommendation is, they've been tested that they will be efficient up until that time. If you use it beyond that time, it, it would be a, an off-label use and their manufacturers could not guarantee the, the efficiency. Um, 
there was a second part to that question. I already forgot now. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, I don't think oh changing them. Part so is, I would uh, not so I would not change them more frequently. Often. No, no. So here's the thing, guys. We want to protect ourselves. We have to lessen the amount of circuit breaks that we do because that exposes people at risk, right? So if we think about balancing our safety, one of the ways we can do that is is choosing a a, a a filter where you're able to um, afford less breaks in the circuit. So that's it's the same reason why flow land is not being used in some circumstances because we're avoiding aerosolization and breaks in the circuit. Um, you may be able in, with some ventilators to use heated humidity and use in the inspiratory and expiratory filter for a, a prolonged period of time without having to change them and without having to break the circuit. And I know that from experience in SARS, back in SARS in BC, where they ventilated a, a patient for like weeks with the same inspiratory filter and expiratory filter. But in order to do that, um, you usually are, are only able to do so if your expiratory filter is, is heated or whether actively or passively because you don't have that uh, moisture accumulation. What you have to be mindful of though is the resistance to flow. So although the efficiency of the filter won't decrease, your resistance to flow will significant in, uh, significantly increase if you have a lot of condensate in the filter. And some of us are seeing that now because we don't have heated expiratory, like vents, some vents don't have heated expiratory, whether passive or active, or they don't have VETI systems, whatever set up, whatever they're called. Um, and they're seeing uh, accumulation of moisture in, in, in the filter. If you're seeing that and you're noticing increase in resistance, you've got to change it. But yeah, the moral of the story is use what you can do to minimize circuit breaks. Sorry, that was okay. a long answer. Well, that's good. Uh, I've been so known to be long-winded. <laughs> you mentioned uh, earlier that if electrostatic filter with a heated circuit water will leak through the filter, does that mean the virus will go across through the filter as well? So in areas of high humidity, so if you're in high humidity, the the virus could have potential to go through the the the, uh, the filter membrane um, with a, an electrostatic because it's a it's a thinner membrane and it it doesn't have that mechanical that mechanical way to trap uh, moisture and virus so there there could be potential I mean any one of you could pour a little water into a filter and then cough and and see what it does and it doesn't matter what filter manufacturer you, you you're buying electrostatic it just functions in a different way than mechanical filtration okay uh can you add a filter with active humidity without it becoming saturated with water with active humidity okay so if you had a humidifier running yep. can you put a filter in line without it becoming saturated mm, i don't think you can I don't think so. I don't either. think you can. No, I think what you're going to do, and I think why they're thinking that is we want to protect ourselves. So the idea is we have a filtration for the ventilator, which is super cool, but we don't have filtration for us. And I think that's where the worry is in the breaking of circuit. And that's why they're wanting to put a filter on the end of that. But uh, it's, knowing what we know, right, that that humidity is going to is going to be impacted on that filter and you're going to have a huge increase in resistance to flow. Yeah. Uh, and, and in fact, there's a, a picture going around of a, like a setup with a BBM and it has a filter on it. Uh, and I was in the situation not long ago, actually, in one of the hospitals I work in. And the anesthetist said to me, so you're going to tape the filter to the ET tube once we get this person intubated. I'm like, well, they're on a ventilator circuit, though, and I've got humidity running. No, I'm not doing that, I said. No. So it will come up. So it's a good question. Here's the yeah, next it's a really one. good M100 question. Yeah. Internal filters in the exhalation manifold of the ventilator. Can these be reused? Can we sterilize them? Uh, can we sterilize the disposable to conserve supplies? So that is a good question. I do not believe um, that you can reuse disposable filters. Certainly, if you look at the device use instructions, say for instance for the like the PV980, there or the 840, um, some manufacturers have reusable filters that can be sterilized and reused. 
but there there is no there's been no direction that I'm aware of from any ventilator manufacturer that you're able to sterilize uh, disposable filters. And I would highly doubt that that would happen anytime soon because in order to change regulations or change usage like that, it has to go through Health Canada approvals and testing. And th that's, that's months, if not years. So I don't think so. And if I do hear anything, I'll certainly will share it with the, our, with the community. Kelly, do you have any comment on that? You gotta take yourself off mute. It's nice to see you without a mask, Kelly. You're still on mute. You are still on mute. Uh, Sign language? <laughs> you're still on mute, Kelly. So, I think it's on your end, though. No? Okay. All right. That's okay. Text me an answer and I'll, I'll talk. I'll say it later. Um, okay. So okay. we've got for a PB560 ventilator with a single limb circuit with the heated humidity and not a HME, what is the appropriate filter? Should it be placed on the exhalation valve? If so, should it be changed frequently? I do not know the answer to that question. I will need to consult with our ventilation specialist. Just because I've never used the vent and I don't have the, the, the information in front of me, so I don't want to tell lies. I don't want to tell you a true story I just made up. So I will post that answer to, uh, for you um, on the website. Okay, thanks. I've, Sorry I've about recorded, that. I recorded that. That's, that's okay. okay. We can find that answer. Uh, does the filter for single limb trilogy recommend as as recommended as well uh, N one hundred advent? Okay, I think that's this is in the same vein. I, so I, can't really, I don't think we need to. But we'll have to look at that one later. So uh, what? How about the participants? We'll find out about LTV trilogy and the PV vent. So far, we'll add them to the list and we'll post whatever resources we can amass on those ventilators. Right. Okay. okay. Um, if we're using mechanical filters with heated circuits for a prolonged period of time, uh, will will the filter efficiency decrease over time? So again, you have to look at your device use instructions, like the manufacturer. So some ventilators, the exhalation of like filters can be left in place for a prolonged period of time, but it's going to vary based on ventilator. It's going to it's going to vary based on the the ventilator. Okay. Whether or not it has active or passive heating, um, it, it's really going to, I think it's going to vary. So. so we actually had a comment back from Tony in um, Sault Ste. Marie. And oh, Tony, hi, Tony says, yeah, he says PIDAC, so that's the uh, infection control, of whatever they're called, um, yeah. gurus. They, do, they say in the document, any medical device labeled as a single use are not to be re reprocessed. So mm -hmm. there's our answer. Yes, for, absolutely. For yeah. I think uh, by re, if we try to do those things, I, I, know we, I know we're crafty, we're crafty RTs. Some of the stuff we do uh, does the trick, but <laughs> is it legal? I don't know. Uh, I, I would be really careful about, about that, right? Yeah. For our uh, safety too. Yeah, there is a really good question here. So actually I was, um, we're working on something and I'm gonna say this because of this question. So there's, you know, the potential for anesthetic gas machines uh, to be used for critical care ventilation if we run out of critical care beds and we all know yeah. that. So the question is around the use of anesthetic machines and filters. So. What do you recommend we should use if we need to use a gas machine for a critical care patient? Okay, so what I would recommend is that you you um, you use the Canadian um, guidance on purposing anesthetic machines as ICU ventilators document, uh, which I've, I posted the link for. They actually go into detail about uh, filters and go so far as to provide numbers. Uh, like part numbers of the filters that you would use and, and in what type of configuration you would use them in. So where I would defer to that? Where, where did you post that? Um, you so post it's that? on, oh, sorry here. It's on, it's under these, under these resources. I got to figure out which one it is. Can you? Okay. Uh, it's oh, under it's on one of these. Re, it's on my side. Sorry. It is on okay, my side. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, 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 yeah it's on okay, my great. side. Okay. Uh, in addition, 
uh, Tony puts in here, in addition to PIDAC document, Health Canada's statement on reprocessing single-use devices, and he gives the um, the website. So uh, we'll, we'll Thank you, Tony. take that out here. Yeah, and, and we'll post that. That's good. Thanks, Tony. All right. Um, the next one is with Puritan Bennett, it uses special expiratory filter. If the supply is out, what is your thought about having a PB800 expiratory filter with mechanical filter changed every 12 hours? Sorry, say that. Can you just ask that again? <laughs> yeah. With a PB, it uses a okay. special expiratory filter, which we know. Yeah. If the supply runs out, what is your thought about having a PB800 expiratory filter that's a reusable with a mechanical filter that's changed every 12 hours? Hmm. That's a I'm good not question. sure. Yeah, it's a, no, it's a really, really good question. What I do know from working at Medtronic, and uh, although I'm not in the ventilator division, is that um, should a situation like that arise, Medtronic would uh, be able to direct and help customers in choosing the most appropriate and effective um, substitute. Um, and I know that that's something that uh, is being worked on right now uh, in consultation uh, with a variety of people uh, as a, you know, as a contingency plan. So I, I want to answer that, but I think the best answer is, is that if it comes to that, please know that you'll be supported by your companies, no matter who they are, in aiding you find a solution so that you can safely ventilate your patients. Is, is that fair? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just um, really not in a position to recommend that given that I, I don't have that area of specialty and uh, certainly we have to make sure that whatever we recommend um, is not um, off-label use because that, that can have some very serious repercussions. But if it comes to that, we'll, we will have you covered, so. Okay, this is our last question. We're almost at 1.30. Uh, so we're currently changing the HME every 24 hours. Would it be reasonable to change a PRN? And here's the caveat. Is there a way to discern whether it's time, either visually looking at it or some other way, thinking about minimizing circuit breaks, but not compromising the filter efficiency? That's a really good yeah, question. That's a really, really, really good question. I don't know that eyeballing it um, is a really effective way of, of measuring. And I don't, I don't know of, I'm not aware of any mechanism by which you could measure to see whether or not it's due to be changed. So yeah, I would again, I would again, yeah. Is there any way that it shows in the resistance on the vents, uh, the measurement? It could. it could, depending on what ventilator you're using, you may notice a change if you're able to, to perform some of those measurements. Um, but again, using it, it, it using it longer than what's recommended is um it's it's not an ideal situation really for anyone but i understand why you're asking that question mm -hmm. <laughs> i can't tell you differently is what i'm saying so i follow your device use instructions <laughs> and you probably okay. can't tell visually i are, are no i i'm not aware of that if, if i get any information on how to do that like these practical things i definitely promise you that i will i will share it or have okay. those people share it okay Sounds good. Uh, there's a comment from Jody. Actually, this is nice, and I'm hoping she's sending it to the office at rtso.ca email address. She says, "I'm sending you an email with the trilogy information because someone asked about that." So that's good. Yay! Thank you. Sounds good. Thank you so much. See, okay. we RTs are so smart. We have so much knowledge. Like we're such a unique profession, and it's kind of it's sad, but this is a time for us to shine and work together. And I, I want to thank you guys for um, leaning on industry. Again, I'm just a friendly RT. I just, I'm just here to help. And I know I'm not always at the bedside, but I'm in the background and I have a mass, a, a different kind of specialty of, of information. And that coupled with my 20 years experience as an RT really, I think makes us valuable. So it's nice to see um, um, industry perceived as, as uh, colleagues rather than as sales reps, which I, you know, that's what we are, but I don't, I don't like that name. And just know that there are a lot of us, uh, certainly across Canada, we have a wide um, range of different kinds of healthcare professionals, RTs, biomedical, uh, RNs, um, and we have other really well-educated uh, people as well. 
And other companies are, are also well suited as well to offer you support. And, uh, and right now I can tell you it almost like it made me cry when I called the intersurgical rep to say, Hey, how can we help one another? People are willing to help one another right now. Um, and our goal is just to support you and we care about you. So anyway, that's my cheesy, I love you, RTs, rah, rah, way to go. And, uh, support the RTSO, please. <laughs> we need you. Perfect. That's what I was going to say. So <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Uh, so thanks everybody for listening in and all your questions and and uh, thanks for attending. Um, the next we're looking at potentially maybe something around humidification and another webinar and we're also looking at um, potentially a webinar around the usage of anesthetic machines for critical care patients. That's the other one we're we're looking at. It's just getting the timing for the speakers to come and and do it. So. Knowing yes. everybody's getting busier and busier. Um, I just want to kind of tell you, like, those are our next thoughts. So Kelly and I are going to be working on this over the weekend and on to Monday, and we'll get out the next one as soon as possible. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. As always. You're welcome. Uh, yep. No problem. Can I tell, can I share one more thing today? Um, on the, uh, there's a putting safety first in care of tracheostomy patients amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's, uh, it is being put on by um, the uh, Global uh, Trach uh, Initiative, and I, I'll, I'll say we can post that link. I know it's today, and you may not have time because you already had to listen to me for an hour. Um, but I, if there's any key pertinent learnings, I'll also post that for you because uh, I've been getting a lot of questions about trachs and filtration and such. So I'll share that. Anyway, sorry about that. If Thank you. If you're listening to it and you can download the slide deck, uh, maybe we could post it on the website. Okay. Yeah, that's that'd be cool. great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, that's super. So uh thank, thank you so much. Thanks for everyone. Everybody. Thank you, Paula. And uh yeah, if you have an opportunity, please join the RTSO. We're always looking for new members and volunteers. <laughs> All right. And uh, and they're awesome. So <laughs> we we got your back, RTs. Oh, I should See say us. the uh the recording and uh the slide decks will be posted probably tomorrow. And any questions will be posted by Monday. Thank you. Cool. Bye. Bye-bye. Go RTs. <laughs>